Hello and welcome to Connect First, your 2016 TCPA Compliance Guide, brought to you by McMurray, Peterson, and Schuster, Contact Center Compliance, DNC.com, Single Source Telecom, and of course, Connect First. First, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, I am the VP of Channels at Connect First. I've been in the contact center industry for about 20 years. Um, originally started out as an agent on the phones and started and, and helped recover contact center companies after that and, and eventually got into the technology side where I was the chief operating officer at Voice One Solutions, um, also the director of Europe, Middle East, and Asia Pacific at Touchstar Incorporated. And now I'm with Connect First as the VP of Channels. I'd also like to introduce our next panelist, who is Michelle Schuster a partner at McMurray, Peterson, and Schuster. Uh, she has extensive experience in assisting clients involved in highly the highly regulated industries we're in. Um, and I'll let Michelle kind of introduce herself once she gets going. Uh, Ryan Thurman will also be on. He's the sales and marketing director with over 10 years of proven sales and marketing experience in the contact center industry with dnc.com. We'll also have Rich Lang, the president of Single Source Telecom, uh, which Rich has been in the in the telecommunication industry since 96, uh, and been in the contact industry, industry for just as long. Um, and then we have, of course, Steve Biederman, who will be giving our, our closing statement. He is the CEO at Connect First, uh, and he was previously with Touchstar Software, Vocalcom, uh, and, and many other softwares, and has been a proven growth expert in the contact center industry and technology. So before I get started, I want to do some quick house cleaning items. All but the speakers will be muted today. Uh, after the presentation, and as time permits, we'll be able to answer any questions you submit via the web control panel. On the control panel to the right, you'll see the ability to expand out in the, the orange arrow. Uh, your control panel may not look exactly like this image, uh, but it'll be pretty close and you'll be able to expand it out, go to your questions area, type in your questions and hit send. And then we'll try to answer those questions again at the end of the, the presentation. If we don't get time to answer your questions, we will be following up directly with the answers to those questions. So now without further ado, I'd like to introduce Michelle. Uh, Michelle, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, and uh, thank you for having me as a panelist on today's presentation. Um, before I get started with the, the presentation I have prepared for today, I think it's a good idea to bring you up to speed on some current events uh, that I've been working on uh, with some regulatory agencies and also as general counsel for PACE, the Professional Association for Customer Engagement. Uh, first, uh, I wanted to talk about soundboard technology or avatar technology. Uh, PACE was approached by the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, about a month and a half ago to let us know that they had some concerns over a staff advisory letter that they had issued to a company called Call Assist. Uh, Call Assist had um, pioneered uh, soundboard technology, uh, which allows a company to use pre-recorded uh, conversation pieces or pre-recorded um, uh, segments for scripting that allows an agent to pick those pre-recorded scripting uh, segments in order to have conversations with uh, a called party. And those conversations are controlled by the agent. It's not a one-way form of communication um, that uh, would be similar to a pre-recorded message. And that was the FTC's opinion when they issued the call assistant uh, staff opinion letter. The FTC, when they reached out to us, said that they have some concerns about that letter and uh, as can happen, apparently there are companies out there that are abusing the guidance that they provided and they have one agent that's handling a significant amount of calls, um, sometimes three or four or five calls uh, at a time which the FTC is saying that that's not the type of meaningful interaction that they had contemplated when giving the call assistant opinion letter to conclude that those types of uh, soundboard technology calls were not pre-recorded messages. Uh, we will be meeting with the Federal Trade Commission to discuss this issue. Uh, there is a group out there called the Soundboard Association that's meeting with us as well, and we're hoping um, to provide 
enough information to the FTC that if they are contemplating issue it, uh, issuing another staff opinion letter, uh, that it will be friendly to the industry and address the concerns of the companies that have invested millions of dollars in pioneering this technology and, and the companies that are using them. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, I can tell you through our PACE website, we'll be updating members on this issue. And if it's something you're interested in, we drafted a white paper on this uh, on the subject matter. It's also on the PACE website. Uh, the second uh, item I want to discuss before getting to the presentation is the appeal of the FCC's declaratory ruling that was issued in July of 2015 with regard to the TCPA and its prohibitions against cell phones, which obviously is the topic of much of the rest of this presentation. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, a number of companies and associations have appealed uh, or asked the courts to review the FCC's declaratory ruling from the summer. Uh, we believe that uh, there are a number of issues with that declaratory ruling and uh, as a result filed a petition for review in the DC Circuit Court. We have fully briefed that issue before the court uh, and those briefings are available also on PACE's website. And um, we are now waiting to uh, have oral arguments scheduled in, in the, at the DC Circuit Court. Um, the court um, recesses for the summer, so there's only really two options at this point, we believe, as to when those oral arguments will happen. One would be in May, which we think highly unlikely since they haven't been scheduled yet. Uh, what is more likely is that those oral arguments will happen after recess and likely in September. Uh, once those oral arguments have concluded, the DC Circuit Courts will take the DC Circuit Court will take the matter under consideration. So. We should have a decision on those petitions for review uh, sometime before the end of the year or beginning of 2017. So definitely something to stay tuned to uh, as that decision will have a significant impact on, on our industry. And we're hoping that it will be a good impact. We're hopeful that we'll be successful in the arguments that we're making before the DC Circuit Court. Okay, so with that said, let's get to the presentation. And what I've been asked to do is talk about what the highest risk areas are right now for contact centers. And obviously at the top of that list and why most of you are on this call now is the TCPA and its prohibition against calls or texts to cell phones. We're gonna spend a significant amount of time uh, with the various speakers talking about that topic. And I'll go over from a legal perspective uh, at a high level uh, what our issues are and why that area is such a, a high risk. Also, I don't want people to forget about DNC violations. The lawsuits that we fought, see filed uh, with um, TCPA called a cell phone prohibition or, or violations frequently also have DNC violations included in those lawsuits. So remember that a do not call violation is a TCPA violation. So those same penalties that are available for calls to cell phones are also available for do not call violations. So very important that we um, stick to the, the rules and the laws that we've been following since the early 2000s around do not call issues. Pre-recorded message issues are also something that we need to be concerned about. The TCPA's prohibitions against pre-recorded messages and also the next topic faxes still apply. So if you are using any type of pre-recorded message, you need to make sure that you are getting the proper type of consent to make those telephone calls. And faxes require specific um, disclosures and specific business relationships to be able to make those or send those faxes to, uh, to recipients. So those, those fax requirements are very technical. And if you as a company are still sending faxes, even if it's not for marketing, you need to make sure that you are meeting all of the requirements for sending faxes. So um, uh, those are, are, are the areas that we're gonna be talking about today. You know, when we get involved with these consumer class actions or when we're assisting companies with compliance failures, uh, we see a um, pretty, um, uh, similar list as to what the issues have been that led uh, to either the lawsuit or these compliance failures. First is the failure to obtain the proper type of consent and then to prove that you have that consent. Uh, we're gonna talk about what type of consent you need for calls to cell phones. And uh, equally as important as having that consent is being able to document and then to reproduce those documents that evidence consent 
uh, I have been a strong proponent and have been telling clients and uh, also in these types of presentations that it is so critical to get consent to contact your customers or potential com customers at every touch point with that customer. There are a lot of companies out there that have great solutions for documenting consent. Take a look at those and make sure that you're, that you're documenting consent. Also, um, we see as a common issue in these types of lawsuits the failure to record or honor entity-specific do not call requests. So especially with the professional plaintiffs that uh, unfortunately are leading so many of these TCPA class actions, they are savvy enough to make an internal do not call request at some point during the interaction of, of the, the list of telephone calls that have been made to them. And unfortunately, all too, too many companies are refusing to, or refusing maybe the wrong word, are not honoring these internal do not call requests. And that leads to a whole other set of issues uh, for uh, companies and uh, is a basis for some of those lawsuits. Reassigned phone numbers um, and not having a process in place to deal with reassigned numbers. Uh, there are services out there that, although they are not 100% accurate, uh, they're claiming 70 to 85% accuracy with being able to identify reassigned numbers. So uh, that's uh, something that's worthwhile taking a look at. Also, with B2B calls, we frequently find that uh, companies that are making B2B calls don't understand that the TCPA prohibitions apply equally to B2B calls as B2C calls. Uh, so just remember that the prohibitions against calling cell phones apply to all calls. It doesn't matter what that type of call is, including political calls, charitable calls, B2B calls. They're all, uh, they're all uh, prohibited unless the top, pr proper type of consent is uh, obtained or you're using a manual dialing system. Uh, and then last, uh, blind reliance on lead generators or vendors. Uh, if I had a dime for every time I had a client to uh, represent uh, or, or have a representation made to them by a lead generator that they have opt-in consent, whatever that means, uh, I'd be a pretty wealthy person right now. Um, lead generators uh, must be capable of documenting that consent and reproducing the consent, and we need to make sure that it's the type of consent for the campaigns that you would be engaging in. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to talk about the Spokio case. It's interesting um, because it's pending before the Supreme Court, um, um, before um, um, the death of Justice Scalia, we had thought that the chances were pretty good that we as an industry would have a favorable ruling in the Spokio case. Uh, that uh, now is uh, not, not so certain, and right now I think the court is equally divided. But the reason this, court, this, this opinion is important is because it deals with who has standing to bring a class action lawsuit. And when I'm talking about standing, I, I mean that the class action plaintiff must have certain types of damages, they call them Article Three damages, they must have some type of actual harm in order to be able to bring uh, an action in federal court and that just a statutory damage is not enough. So uh, this would obviously be an important issue in the TCPA context. If somebody couldn't prove actual damages, uh, they wouldn't have jurisdiction to bring these types of lawsuits. So uh, stay tuned uh, for what happens with that, uh, with that opinion as, as we move forward. So let's start by talking about call recording before we dive into the TCPA. I, I list this as a high risk area because we are still seeing a lot of consumer class action lawsuits in the call recording area. And the issue here is that um, there are uh, call recording laws out there that require consent of the parties on the telephone in order for that call to be recorded or even just monitored. Um, the interesting thing about these laws is that they're usually found in criminal codes and they have to do with wiretapping. They weren't uh, enacted in order to deal with telemarketing, um, but they have now been used in the telemarketing arena. On the federal level, you only have to have one person to that telephone call consent to the recording. You usually do that by having your agents consent to the recording. But there are a number of states that are listed on the slide that are either two-party or all-party consent states which means that the person that you've called must also give consent to have that phone call recorded or monitored. Uh, in California, there are penalties up to $5,000 per call. So as you can imagine, the multipliers here are huge uh, and have led to some pretty significant 
settlements because of the, uh, the risk exposure for these types of cases. And uh, those are listed on this slide. Um, and those numbers have continued to grow. So this is just such an easy area of the law to comply with by providing that disclosure at the beginning of the call that the call could be monitored or recorded. Uh, so make sure you're, you're taking care of this, especially in the two-party states. But I, I think for most um, clients, it's easiest to just make the disclosure on all calls, regardless of the state. Also, we can't forget about regulatory actions. There are 50 state attorney generals, the FTC and the FCC out there that have entire sections of attorneys and investigators that are dedicated to direct to consumer sales and the channels that are used for those direct to consumer sales, including telemarketing. And um, the, the thing that you really can't forget is that all of these consumer protection statutes have uh, what or, or sections have um, jurisdiction to enforce what's called a UDAP statute. UDAP stands for unfair or deceptive acts or practices. And it comes from the FTC's uh, FTC Act, uh, which says that um, companies are prohibited from making unfair or engaging in unfair or deceptive acts and practices. Uh, so the states have modeled the FTC Act and have also uh, those types of prohibitions. So you have to make sure from a call center perspective that when you're doing scripting, you, pr you provide all of the material restrictions and disclosures before you make a sale. Uh, the types of things that are material are always price. Uh, if you've got a continuity plan, when those payments will be uh, charged to a consumer. Uh, if you have a no refund policy, that's always considered a material restriction. And just in general, those material restrictions or disclosures are anything that are likely to influence a consumer's decision to buy or not buy. So as you're um, caught up in the channel that we're using and all the regulations that apply there, don't forget these types of uh, regulations that broadly pro prohibit unfair deceptive acts and practices. And I will tell you, most of the companies that get in trouble with UDAP violations, they didn't intend to violate the law. It's just that they didn't get all of the disclosures and the scripting that they needed. So make sure you have competent counsel and compliance officers that are reviewing your scripting so that you have uh, all of the disclosures uh, that you need in your scripting. Um, some common issues cited by the FTC and AGs are listed at the bottom of this slide, um, and uh, you just want to make sure that all of those types of things are covered uh, when, when contemplating regulatory actions. So let's get into the calls to cell phones. That's by far the area that has drawn the most attention since last summer in the FCC's declaratory ruling. And just for those of you that may not know how we got to this point, I'll tell you, uh, just to give you a little bit of history, back in 2012, the FCC announced that they would be amending the TCPA to eliminate the existing business relationship uh, exemption for consent requirements uh, in the TCPA for using an automatic telephone dialing system uh, to make certain types of telephone calls. And that consent, uh, consent would now be required starting in uh, October of 2013. So that was the significant change that they announced and that took effect in 2013. So companies spent a lot of time getting consent and also looking at their dialing systems that if they didn't have consent, uh, that they weren't using an automatic telephone dialing system. The problem is um, that the TCPA is not very clear when um, addressing the definition of an ATDS. Um, and specifically, uh, when talking about an ATDS, um, they, they have a definition that includes the term capacity that we're going to get to here in a moment. But um, the confusion around the terms within the TCPA led to a number of companies and associations seeking a uh, declaratory ruling as to what constituted an automatic telephone dialing system. Those petitions started to be filed back in 2012, and the FCC finally addressed those in its declaratory order uh, in July of 2015, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that now. Um, just remember in general that if you're using an ATDS or a pre-recorded message to, a call, to call uh, or text a cell phone, you have to have the person's prior consent. For a non-telemarketing call, that's prior express consent, which generally means that the person has provided you with their telephone number uh, in the ordinary course of business, and um, there hasn't been a subsequent do not call request, and the call that's subsequently made to the 
uh, cell phone is made during that ordinary course of business. Um, there's a lot of case law around prior express consent, so you want to make sure that you understand the ins and outs uh, and that you're not in any way limiting uh, consent when you're receiving a, a telephone number by saying you'll only use the number for certain purposes. Uh, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but understand there is a whole body of law around what is prior express consent. Um, so um, for non-telemarketing calls, it's prior express consent. For telemarketing calls, you have to have prior express written consent. The statute is very explicit about what's required for prior express consent. You have to disclose that it'll be an ATDS. You have to um, let the consumer know that they don't, they aren't required to give consent as a, a condition of purchase. Uh, so make sure that if you're getting prior express consent that your language is, is drafted in the right way. Again, important to know that the, um, the um, consent uh, is not required if you are not using an ATDS. Uh, also important to remember that mixed calls, meaning they're telemarketing and also transactional, uh, so dual purpose types of calls, uh, those would require prior express consent if they have any telemarketing application to them at all. And then again, uh, this applies equally to B2B and uh, B2C type calls. So what is an ATDS? Um, that is the million dollar question that companies all over the place uh, are struggling with. Um, basically, an ATDS uh, uh, is any uh, telephone system that has the capacity to randomly or sequentially generate numbers and then dial those numbers or to dial in an automatic fashion from a list. Um, when the FCC was providing clarity on what constitutes an ATDS, they were really focusing on this concept of capacity. And uh, we in the industry had thought that capacity meant present capacity, because obviously that's the only important thing, what you intend to be doing at the time you're making the call. Unfortunately, the FCC rejected that, and they said you have to look at the potential ability of the system. Um, and you have to look at what that system is capable of doing, even with the addition of software. Um, they did say that theoretical capacity, meaning um, the example they gave was a rotary telephone, that that would be too theoretical to turn a rotary phone into an ATDS, but that's about the only example uh, that they gave us. Um, so uh, as I said, that's currently being uh, appealed in the DC Circuit Court. Um, I will tell you that the critical component here for companies trying to establish that they have a manual dialing system is you have to be proactive about that. You need to have a defendable position before you make any type of telephone call relying on a manual dialing system. Uh, have an expert or competent legal counsel come in and take a look at your system and provide you with an opinion as to whether it is an ATDS or it's a manual dialing system because there are a lot of things that, that factor into uh, that discussion. And many of those things that factor into those discussions have been uh, discussed by court opinions that have been issued since 2015. So I just want to give uh, you know, a real high level view of what those cases are saying. Uh, that first um, set of cases that are listed under the human intervention test. Um, what we're talking about there is there are a number of courts that when they have looked at these cases and are trying to determine if a, if a case should be dismissed because they agree with the defendants that the system is a manual dialing system, the primary thing that they're focusing on is this concept of human intervention. That if you have human intervention that happens within that calling process, um, then it's not an ATDS, meaning that it's not an automatic or auto-dialed telephone uh, call. And, um, you know, when they're looking at human intervention, they're really looking at every step of the process. I can tell you that the courts have pretty routinely found that just uploading a list is not the type of human intervention we're talking about, but human intervention for every call that has play been placed. Um, I can tell you, because I get this question pretty frequently, that no court has held that a preview dialer, just in and of the fact that it's a preview um, uh, uh, dialer, and really what I mean to say there is click to dial, so somebody who's dialing just one button versus 10 buttons, uh, that the fact that they're not dialing all 10 digits uh, does not automatically make something an ATDS. Um, important though, and uh, I want to be very clear here, that you have to look at the entire system to see what its entire capacity is. But that one fact that you're using one-touch dialing has not been ruled by any court to, uh, in and of itself, turn a dialing system into an ATDS. Um, the, next, uh, the next column of cases under potential capacity test uh, are all cases where the courts 
um, pretty significantly deferred to the FCC, and most of these courts didn't reach any type of decision, but rather sent the case back to the trial court to make some conclusions about the facts in the case. Um, but what they've said is you have to look at the system, and it's not the present capacity, but it's the potential functionality of the system, uh, and you have to um, have enough facts in the case to be able to determine if the uh, potential capacity of the system allows it to randomly or sequentially or predictively uh, dial. Um, so those are where we're seeing the cases uh, primarily focus on since the FCC's declaratory ruling. Um, these are issues that are changing day by day as cases are being decided by the courts uh, and also uh, as we're appealing the FCC's declaratory ruling. So it's really important to stay on top of these issues. I've got a list of resources here. FTC.gov is a great website just for general consumer protection types of issues and uh, telemarketing sales rule issues. So FTC.gov, I would bookmark and I'd go look at their um, news releases on a daily basis that lets you know what the regulators are focusing on. Uh, the FTC has also put together the complying with the TSR, uh, which is a very detailed guide to um, meeting the requirements of the FTC's telemarketing sales rule. Uh, our law firm put out a blog, uh, and we're updating our blog uh, multiple times a week and keeping you up to date on what the latest cases are and other things that affect, uh, affect um, contact center operations, so I'd encourage you to sign up for that. And then also, um, if you are interested in the FCC's declaratory ruling, um, you can uh, get that by going to the FCC website. You can do a search for declaratory ruling. So um, with that, um, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Michelle. So I, I want to uh, hand it over to Ryan. Um, Ryan, go ahead. Hey, Fred. Thanks for having me. This is Ryan with Thurman with Contact Center Compliance, dnc.com. Thanks, Michelle, for the good update on TCPA. And it's interesting because I've been around since the Do Not Call List kind of came out and that was really a main issue for a lot of companies. The TCPA has really become uh, infectious in the way that it's uh, brought in private plaintiff attorneys that have really made a killing at it. Um, one particular attorney made over, claims have made over $30 million in growing uh, against the contact center community and against really our what I consider my client base, you know, people that use our services that are uh, trying to deal with this. And so we've done some work to analyze who some of these plaintiffs are and try to provide another alternative than, you know, just basic level compliance because that doesn't seem to be good enough. And so uh, we've, our clients have basically feel like, you know, up until a year ago, until we came out with our litigator scrub solution, we're really struggling with, we're doing the basic compliance, but we're still getting cases. Um, they're doing all their wireless scrubs, they're doing their do not call scrubs, they're automating everything as possible, but they're still running into, especially now, professional litigators. So um, what we did is we broke down some of the states that you might not, might, might want to make the decision of not even calling into or being very careful in of who some of these litigators are. Um, and so I've put those up for people that can take a look at. Obviously, California, which is where I am, there is a lot of private plaintiffs here. There is a big one in San Francisco that I know, uh, Hyde and Swigert. You do not want to get in a case with these guys. They're professionals from like OST back in 2006. They were one of the original cases. They've been involved in the Sherman case, the Yahoo case, all these different uh, big cases. Um, and then you get folks that, like the guy that supposedly has made $30 million, um, which is the Lemberg Law Group. They've got uh, an application that you need to be aware of that has called, uh, it's blockcalledgetcash.com. They also own Legal Call Blocker. It's an app that a lot of consumers are downloading from them that collects all the caller ID information. Um, so these people are, are real, but they're, and our clients are looking for ways to avoid them because what also seems to be happening, according to a lot of clients I talk to, is that their their lead, downward lead stream is being populated by false uh, people that are coming in to act like customers. It's, a lot of this is mechanically engineered by design. So um, if you want to go to the next slide, 
and talk about, um, you can see kind of some of the, where the highest per, uh, penetration is on, on those folks. But what we came up with is a, a way to track at least people that are um, going to do this, you know, there's public, a lot of it's public information. Um, so we have upwards of 96,000 phone numbers and some change of actual professional litigators and growing. Like Michelle said, it has dramatically increased. And we've been keeping track of litigation for a couple of years now. In the last three months, I mean, we can barely keep up with all the updates and the number of, num of data points that are coming in. We get data from um, actual cases filed, and we were able to identify phone numbers. We have ways to go find phone numbers on other individuals involved in TCP and related class actions. Is a lot of our own clients. We kind of crowdsource the data, so we're kind of trying to share some of it so that we can kind of uh, mitigate some of these damages for people that are trying to stay in business and do the right thing. And then um, you can do do things like either decide to not call these people at all or not text them, hence they can't sue you. Or you could decide that you might want to start tracking your email lead channel and doing uh, real-time lookups because you don't want to get them populated to your contact centers when the leads come in. And it seems to be very effective. Um, we do a lot of testing on that. We almost always are finding litigators in files. Um, we also do some, have done some analysis with our own clients that haven't been uh, able to switch over and get it turned on where like we're finding TCBA litigants in their active files now and so it's it's become much more widespread um, that they, they are a lot of repetitious cases too most of these folks um, you'll be able to see that they are involved in multiple cases at a time um, let's go on to the next slide so one of their big things Michelle mentioned about the, the companies that really struggle with is the idea of reassigned phone numbers. You have consent, you've got the TCBA language um, confirmed from a customer, you put them in the dialer, start calling, all of a sudden you get served with a lawsuit for calling somebody else if you didn't have consent because the number got disconnected and reassigned. It happens a lot more now. Uh, numbers are in short supply with the wireless carriers. There's more cell phones out there, so you see a lot more turnover on, on numbers. So you, you have to do something. It's an easy one for them to form class actions on. Uh, we were asked enough times to, just like anything in software development, you get enough customers want something, to, the software company to try to build something to come up with a product for our customers. And so we're doing a disconnect and reassign uh, cell phone scrubbing, basically where you can identify based on who you think the number is and who it belongs to up against a live telco database and then we can flag it for disconnects and reassigns and also give you the confirmation back and the varying levels of what kind of matches you're running into. Um, it only takes a couple hours to run and we'll even do testing on that for our clients and it's actually really surprising because it's not just a compliance thing that you should be doing, it's a, a number validation. Um, you really want to make sure that your data is up updated. If you you know that you're not going to reach these people, or it's going to belong to somebody else. Obviously, that's a regulatory concern because calling a wrong number, you only get one free pass. And that was a big change and kind of one that doesn't make a lot of sense to the industry. But like Michelle said, until we get some potential relief maybe from the petition with PACE, it's, it, I, would, I would definitely recommend uh, taking care of uh, scrubbing for litigators and figuring out something for di disconnected or reassigned cell phone numbers. Um, they also are, um, it's, it's not so easy to they find a really good way to do this. Um, fortunately, like I said, we had enough customers, we built a, a way to, to automate it with some of our other scrubbing and uh, make it a little less painful than booking into uh, different services. Um, you'll hear from Connect First later on and we do some, uh, some scrubbing with them as well. You really want to try to cover all angles. Let's go to the next slide. The other thing that's kind of uh, sometimes difficult for companies to deal with with TCPA is just like do not call. You, well, you people Companies want to uh, kind of create a safe harbor environment. It's a little different under TCPA because um, you have, you almost have to defend yourself first before you get out of trouble. but 
Um, we've created a kind of a training course about TCPA and the different things you would want to present in a case. So like, let's say you get served, Michelle's in your office, she's going to want to see some sort of training, some kind of um, policies, procedures to help kind of defend the case or recommend, you know, that you're, you're following the, the different rules in the right way. And so we've got a kind of cookie cutter approach. Um, it's really easy to implement. That's been real popular with in terms of dealing with uh, the TCPA. Uh, let's, the next next slide. So the other thing that uh, is interesting, we talk to a lot of folks who, when, when they're looking for a compliance solution, they're often surprised by stuff. Um, so it's, you know, especially in in the B two B space, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to obviously do a poll on here, but. Um, the B2B world is one that the professional litigators have targeted pretty heavily. I can't tell you the number of companies that are like, well, hey, we haven't been doing any scrubbing. All of a sudden, uh, we're getting served with a couple lawsuits, and we didn't really think we had to do anything. We hear this is TCPA. Um, so I think the business-to-business -business angle is one that uh, you really got to watch out for. I've had a couple companies I know that have, are still in litigation a couple years later, uh, looking paying a pretty large settlement fees, and they just didn't know any better. Um, they didn't know their technology was, uh, represented a dialer. They didn't think of themselves that way. And guess what? Litigators have seen multiple cases on that. Uh, the other one that's big this year is the political one. So political uh, robocalls, basically, you still got to have express consent um, and, or express written consent. And so that's another angle. And there are certain states, if you're doing political robocalls, that you just may not want to call at all. Um, because then you get other issues where the state's got more restrictive rules. Same thing with political and charity work. I mean, I talked to a lot of companies. They're like, well, we're exempt. We, you know, we're just uh, soliciting donations. It's like you really have to break it down. There's very, with TCPA, there's such few exemptions, uh, and there's so many angles that you can get sued under. It's just, not, it's just really not worth the risk. So, I mean, usually I re we recommend that, yeah, you have your – Compliance automated as much as possible. You're hitting all the different lists, and you do it all kind of one place. Like I mentioned, we have some uh, testing available, and um, you know, we're, I'd, I'd say you know we're probably you don't have a lot of choices with compliance these days. I mean, you, to do it yourself and try to insource everything is is really a headache. Um, so luckily, we've got some relief, and you know we've got a lot of interest in the especially the litigation scrub product just because it's one of the few things you can do that actually uh, can stop the, uh, kind of like I said, the mechanically engineered cases. So I got some contact, my contact information, but I'm kind of back over everybody else so we can wrap, wrap up on time. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide, Mr. Lang. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I think one of the things that we've you know, that has been expressed over and over again during this webinar is the fact that the TCPA is, is being very aggressive. And I think Ryan said it best when he said that, you know, the call centers and the, the, the audience today, the best thing to do is to defend yourself first. So what we would like to do is help the audience put together, a, you know, a, a proactive strategy that would protect the, protect your business and possibly guard against uh, the possibility of a lawsuit. I think Ryan also mentioned that you need to have a strategy when the you know when the TCPA comes knocking on your door. It's important to have uh, a strategy and show that that as a call center, you're acknowledging the T, uh, TCPA and you're acknowledging what they're trying to do, and it's eventually will become part of the overall campaign or your overall case if you do happen to get. Uh, get dragged into a lawsuit. So I'm going to talk about your telecom services and first starting with data. So if we could go to the next slide. Data is primarily how most companies are connecting to their vendors today. Uh, in the July 2015 order, the FCC was extremely vague on their definition of capacity as well as as potential functionality. And this was something that uh, Michelle touched on, on previously. 
So how does that uh, how does that affect you when you're talking about your your telecom services or your telecom landscape? And really, what 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 should you do? Uh, our recommendation is pretty simple. It's setting up a separate network. So what a separate network does is it creates a definitive line. It creates a definitive separation between church and state, so to speak. It shows potential or, or it draws a line between uh, your non-TCPA traffic and your TCPA traffic. And it definitively eliminates potential capacity. A good example of setting up a separate network would be having a standalone internet connection that is connected to your from your call center to your your telecom service provider that supports the call center and then having a separate internet connection that's only set up for your for your phone system that separation can be you know a dedicated private line or a physical connection from the call center to your hosted service provider if you're not using a hosted service provider for the call center and you have a traditional premise based uh, dialer then have a separate data connection or a separate internet connection that supports that premise based dialer and then having a separate internet or a separate data connection that supports your your PBX. What I also found interesting about the July order is that it referenced uh, the need for human intervention. So if you have, if you look at your infrastructure and if you set it up accordingly, you can physically make it so that there has to be that physical intervention or the physical need for human intervention between your TCPA traffic and your non-TCPA traffic. Uh, earlier we talked about uh, cell phone and making cell phone calls and how that's becoming more and more of a topic in, in the cases that are being presented to the uh, to the TCPA. If you have your your dialer and your PBX and you have and you have a need to make cell phone calls and you have a completely separate network for your phone system or your PBX, you can designate all of your agents to make those cell phone calls from your phone system and because it's a completely separate network, if the TCP ever shows up at your door, well, you know, then you can show a, a willingness to, to comply, but also that you're trying to do the right thing. And personally, I, I've you know never been involved with a, a law a lawsuit, but if you're showing the intent to do the right thing, if you've gone through the action of of separating out your traffic, putting together a separate network, I think it shows that you're trying to do the right thing and it sends the right message. Setting up a, a separate network is not only a good uh, TCPA strategy or prevention strategy. But it's also just a bottom line good business practice. If you have a separate network, let's say for your non-TCPA traffic and your TCPA traffic, and one of your primary carriers goes down, if you're if you're dealing with AT&T, and we all know AT&T does not have any outages, but let's just pretend that they do, and your primary internet connection goes down, well, you can technically transfer your business over to the TCPA compliant separate network or a redundant route. Now you've got redundancy, you've got you know failover that, that protects the business. Personally we believe that the setting up a separate network is very similar to having it's like a, a life insurance policy. You know, you can invest in it today, you know, you may never need it, but it's better than you know paying a, a large fine down the road. All right, let's go to the next slide. With regards to voice services, this is one that I actually found to be, um, you know, very interesting because the burden of proof is is on the caller. If what uh, we've seen is that when there's a, a you know a lawsuit, and uh, Michelle referenced this earlier, they're still trying to 
determine if the party receiving the call, you know, had any, you know, harm, right? If there was, if there was any, if they have a claim, or if they suffered any, you know, you don't really. There's no harm call just because you received a phone call. What's interesting is that, you know, the person receiving the call right now doesn't have to prove that they had, there was any harm done. But the caller, the call center, all the burden of proof is on you. So therefore, what do you do? Right? You have to make calls. You have to have phone service. But how do you protect yourself? Truly, the only thing that, that we can recommend is that you have a phenomenal relationship with your phone service provider or your, your telecom service provider. Simply because if if you do get caught into a lawsuit or if you do get dragged down that path, you're going to need their support. You're going to need them to, to back you. The FCC stated in the uh, July order that they recommend strong support and full participation from the carriers. If you don't have that type of a relationship with your carriers where you can call them up and say, I need you to support me on this, I need you to, to back me on this, then you know, I'd highly recommend finding someone who can help facilitate that relationship. The other strategy that we recommend to our clients is very similar to, to the data strategy, and that is, again, separation. You have to be able to separate your manual dial uh, cell phone traffic from you know, what we would call non-TCPA traffic. If you're showing that definitive separation between the two, you're showing that willingness uh, to comply, and that you know, is probably your best defensive measure. With SIP service, it's very easy because SIP is done over the internet. It's done IP to IP, so it's very easy to set up two different IP addresses. If you have SIP-enabled equipment in your office, then you generally will have two different types of equipment in the office. So then you generally will have the ability to run TCPA traffic on one and non-TCPA traffic on the other. If you're not SIP enabled, then you know we suggest investing in standalone uh, TD or, or TDM T1 circuits. Again, it shows separation between the two, and it shows that you're putting the best. Um, policies in place. The last little bullet point or thing that I wanted to talk about was call records or what's formerly known as uh, CDRs. Most people are unaware of the fact that the carriers, whether you know large carriers or small, they generally will only keep the call detail records on file for 60 to 90 days. After 90 days, uh, most of them are destroyed. So as a policy, you want to have a carrier that will allow you to download your, your call detail records. You want to have a place that you're storing them, and then you want to save them as long as possible. I've, I've had many requests from, from our customers a year after the fact where they'll call up and say, hey, I need this. I need you to find this phone number. Can you tell me if I legitimately called this person on this day? And I, we have those relationships in place, so it's not a problem for me to call the carrier and dig up a phone number from a year ago, but it would definitely be challenging if you don't have those relationships and you're not saving your, your call detail reports. So you need to make sure that uh, for your voice services and your data services, you have a strong uh, partner who can be your advocate uh, with, the, with the carriers. But I know we're getting close to the top of the hour, so... I'm going to turn it over to you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Rick. Um, I want to introduce Steve Biederman uh, and let him give a, a, a few words. Um, Steve, go ahead. Well, thanks a lot, Fred. Uh, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. We literally had uh, a few hundred people on this call, and Connect First has uh, always been a knowledge leader in terms of whether it's regulation or technology or feature sets. Uh, in this case, we find ourselves very, uh, we find the audience very attracted 
to regulatory issues. And I think it says a lot about uh, what we're doing. I just two weeks ago was speaking at a conference on TCPA regulations, and I think it's important for us to sort of recognize uh, that you can do the right thing and you can still get sued. So as an example, Connect First, uh, we are just an example of this. We, we were the first people in the industry to develop cloud-based TCPA compliant uh, software in our safe mode. Nonetheless, everybody uh, now has this available to you and it certainly doesn't ensure that you're not going to have 96,000 uh, professional litigators come and, and risk your business. Uh, I started in the industry as a call center agent myself in the 1970s and I've worked exclusively within contact centers for many years building many platforms. Uh, what I will tell you is that when we were calling off of lists, we were doing it with lots of people because we, we were selling things, we felt that it was the right way to get information out using voice, using the phone to do that. When automation came into being, uh, and we began to accelerate that process, what the outcome of that was, was uh, the federal and local do not call list. Uh, now you see regulation in terms of increased, uh, increased attention to TCPA. And what, what continues to happen, is, as I see it, is this, is that where uh, the public in many ways is really saying, quit calling me unless I, I let you. And uh, because we find it intrusive. At the same time, the industry isn't abandoning the industry and the ideal of contacting people on a high volume basis. So uh, then what happens is, is we bring, as does this webinar do, we bring litigators uh, or we bring attorneys together with telco together with uh, data scrubbing services uh, like dnc.com together with great technology like ours that allows you to, to meet the goals and then at the end of the day you still have 96,000 uh, professional litigators out there trying to find ways uh, to break through and they're not doing anything different than we in contact centers are trying to do which is to break through the regulation and to find a means of an income for ourselves. So no matter what you do when you're in a business, as I build this business, I think of the same thing, there is always an underlying risk that, that is associated with any business that you have. And what you, what you need to give attention to is, is not necessarily to change your business model, but to be sure that you're giving attention, as Rick had said, uh, separating systems, uh, the cloud now allows that to be a lot more cost effective than the old on-premise systems, having redundancy, storing data as we have solutions to do for a lifetime uh, and recording so that you can protect yourself. It's not an insurance policy to do everything correctly, but it really is a, a, a logical consequence. So in, in ending this, what I'll tell you is this, we'll continue to come out with uh, information that will help you make good business decisions to mitigate your risks. There are risks in our industry. I think we're all aware of it. You can never run from them all, but you can, you can put them into a category that is manageable. I suggest you use Connect First or a system similar to ours, simply because not only do we have you know, great software and the ability to uh, to show to you that we care for the industry enough to continue to, to provide knowledge, but because we partner with, with the top litigators, we partner with the top uh, lead scrubbing services, we, we partner with the right uh, tier one telcos, and, and we find ways to protect and store your data. So I suggest you do all of that. Realize this, that we're always here to help in the conversation, debate the finer points of it, and at the end of the day, offer you uh, suggestions and solutions and, and be your partner. So again, hundreds of people around here. I know there are some questions. I'm going to hand it back to Fred. I just want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Steve. Um, so this is my favorite part. We get to answer some questions, and all of my presenters are, uh, if you could, 
Um, just keep yourselves on mute until you're ready to answer. Uh, and then, you know, let's try to make this a little interactive. Um, so the first question I got, uh, Amy, I'd probably say, or sorry, Amy, Michelle, I would say this one's probably for you. Um, had a question regarding contacting shareholders, um, you know, for a particular company. Um, you know, do you, uh, there isn't any exemptions or is there any exemptions around shareholder contacts, um, you know, with automated messaging, uh, capturing uh, votes, anything like that? Unfortunately, there is no exemption for calling shareholders. So if this is just calling shareholders to inform them about a meeting or some other type of company information, that's going to be a non-telemarketing informational call. So in order to make those calls to cell phones, it's going to require that you have prior express consent, which means that that shareholder needs to have provided the telephone number. So you didn't do a list append or anything like that, and they haven't made a subsequent do not call request. Um, as far as other provisions, though, of the TCPA that would have to do with do not call and um, and call abandonment and those other types of specifically targeted towards telemarketing regulations, none of those would apply. So you just have to worry about faxes and calls to cell phones uh, when you are, and pre-recorded messages when you are contacting your shareholders. Okay, excellent. Um, any, anybody, any of the panelists, um, I, I've got uh, quite a few questions regarding click to dial and where, where it falls within TCPA. Does anybody want to comment on that? Well, I would say, this is Steve, uh, I, I would say it, it's, it's not simply click to dial that is the issue. Certainly, being able to have an agent-generated call is an issue. But at the same time, uh, as Michelle had alluded to earlier, uh, you have to be able to make sure that you're managing your data. So contact centers for years uh, have really used call center technology as a means separate from automated dialing to manage their data and to be able to run their business reporting uh, and otherwise. So being able to click to make a phone call is a key piece of it where the system allows you no alternatives. And then at the same time, managing your data in the right way well, well scrub becomes the, the second piece of that. So it's a multiple answer to uh, to uh, to actually what sounds like a simple question. <laughs> Any of the other panelists? No, Steve. Yeah. Just to, Steve, just to kind of you know follow up on that, it's important to know there is no court case that's currently good law that says that preview dialing in and of itself is unlawful. So the click to dial or the one touch or the preview dialing in and of itself is never the issue. You've got to look at the whole calling system. And you have to see what that system is capable yeah. of doing. So if you can flip a switch from preview dial to predictive dialer, absolutely that's going to be an ATDS. But if you have a system right. that is locked down, contractually can't be changed, and doesn't have the ability to automatically dial from a list, then you know I think you're going to be okay. Now having said that, go out and get legal counsel or get an expert to look at your dialing system to confirm that. But click to dial in and of itself is not prohibited. I'm sorry, yeah, Ryan, that's go ahead. The that's the definition of capacity. If does the system have the capacity to do uh, an auto dial and click to dial within the same, you know, same system? You know, I was thinking of a uh, of a client that we have just taken on that is really one of the world's largest BPOs, and they have a work group that has been using 300 agents manually dialing, not working through any any type of automation whatsoever. Uh, they still found themselves in a litigious moment, and the reason was is that they weren't managing their data correctly, and they couldn't prove the the data side of it. And I, I am not uh, Michelle. I'm not with your experience in it, and I don't understand all of the reasons and implications for that. But what they ended up doing was saying, let's go back to, in our case, a cloud-based system that, that doesn't allow us any ability uh, for automation, but at the same time allows us to manage carefully our database, and they sort of felt like that would give them a bit more protection. Does that, does that make sense to you? 
Sorry about that. I had to take my boat on mute because I'm driving now. But but that makes absolute sense. I, I I would imagine the issue that your client ran into was all they had were telecom records. They didn't have any records that showed that a specific type of dialer was used. And therefore, right. although you're, the, the plaintiff is required to prove their case, they've made the allegation that an ATDS was used, and they've probably said there was a delay when their uh, plaintiff picked up the phone, therefore indicating it was a predictive dialer. So now that puts the company on the defense that they have to prove that they used a manual dialing system. And unless you have records that show what dialer you used, not just the fact that a call was placed through telecom records, then it's very difficult. So, yes, Steve, you're, you're spot on with you. You got to have the data. You've got to have a right. record retention schedule that gives you a, a defensive position. That's where um, separation okay. would be would be a, a perfect right. um, you know solution because if you have a separate uh, you know IP address for for that call opposed to the other one, you could very easily prove that it didn't come from the auto dialer that it came from the the uh, click to dial. You could set up I SIP trunks to where that the click to dial campaigns only go down this path and then the auto dialer traffic goes down down that path. Gotcha. Ryan, I have, this is Steve. I have a question for you. Did you did I hear you say that the burden of proof is on the contact center, not on not on the person that is uh, litigating? Um, well, let me answer. Let me add one comment before I answer that, which is on the the manual dial issue, which is something that a lot of our clients are surprised by. Is there's a handful of states. There's five: Texas, Arizona, New Jersey, Wyoming, and Louisiana, where you can't even if you don't have a business relationship or better yet a, a consent from a consumer, you can't hand dial cell phones in those states. So even though you go to a manual call solution, unless you've got some other history and can meet the state's exemption, some of the states uh, out there, especially like some of the big ones like Texas, Arizona, are going to present a real big problem uh, when it comes to even manual dialing because most people have cell phones now. That's why the numbers are getting reassigned more frequently. Um, so as far as the, where, where the litigation comes in, I, I think the 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 thing that we didn't talk about, which we get asked a, a lot about, or at least from our last summit, was the idea of the uh, what's the term? I'm not a lawyer, but it's vicarious liability, where you, you I mean you see multiple parties being brought in under a TCPA case. You know, the person that made the calls. A lot of times, the litigation they'll go after the deep pockets, which is why if you look at a lot of the cases, I mean, you're talking, you know, Chase, Wells a huge amount of financial institutions are uh, being targeted uh, because then they can go after the you know the seller but a lot of times the a, a call center can get roped in uh, as well uh, fairly easy under TCPA um, you know um, I, I just said another one that keeps coming up again so I want to bring this one up and again uh, open to all the panelists um, text messaging where does it fall within DNC and, and uh, TCPA um, anybody want to want to take that one? So uh, it's, it's yeah yeah. So that's a um, that is uh, already a, a fact that's been decided um, uh, by the FCC and uh, by courts that a text is the exact same thing as a call to a cell phone. So all of the regulations that we've been talking about for the last hour that apply to calls to cell phones apply to text messages and so you have to worry uh, you know about everything from do not call to uh, are you using uh, a manual dialing system uh, or an ATDS that's going to require consent so um, all of uh, all everything we've talked about that we've said call to cell phone you can substitute the word text and it applies you know you reminded me of, uh, of a question I was with Ryan at at their uh, compliance seminar a couple of weeks ago and someone was asking Ryan I believe the question of ringless voicemail you know where you're dropping voicemails onto a cell phone without the phone ringing and Ryan do you remember that and what the outcome of that question was we, we Ryan? You, on mute? you may be on mute Oh, we lost. Well, we, we lost it Ryan. Sounds like we lost Ryan. What I would say. Well, I, I can I, tell I, you. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. 
Go ahead, Michelle. Well, so that issue has not been decided, um, and I, I don't know. So if it's not ringing to the cell phone, an argument can be made that there is no call to a cell phone because it, it's not going to the cell phone. It's going to the voice message servicing. Um, I would I would tell you, though, that's probably another area where you want to get an opinion from your lawyer on so you have a defendable position to fall back on. Um, because as we have seen in this area, as uh, kind of exceptions to the rules start popping up, they find a way to regulate them. So it's an area you want to be careful. Of. Is that is that pretty much the same answer you got, Steve? It is, and I think um, some of the contact centers themselves set went one step further in their own analysis and said that, well, you know, the the calls are being done by an automated system. So a, a the message is is delivered through automation and not through a human you know a human intervention and so logic prevailing uh, it would appear to be a very um, you should be very careful about it if you, you intend to do it right um, so real quick uh, you know I know we're over time but we've got a, a tremendous amount of more questions we're not going to get to all of them but I do have one more I want to wrap up on but do know that uh, we are going to follow up with all these questions and and try to respond back to you as long as you logged in uh, and and put your contact information into the go to webinar um, we will reach back out to you with those answers for those questions or do the best we can um, so the last question I want to finish up on uh, is um, there's a, there was a couple of people asking Michelle and this one goes right back to you again so I apologize for you um, but what do you think is the likely outcome of the FTC case against Dish Network that is currently pending. Yeah. So, um, in case folks don't know about this, the FTC and five state AGs sued Dish Network, and uh, the lawsuit was around a couple of different issues. But at the the heart of it was um, do not call violations by vendors or uh, independent partners. I think is what they're called, or independent vendors of DISH Network. So the regulators have alleged that DISH Network didn't properly manage uh, that relationship and was aware that do not call violations were occurring. Uh, early on, uh, they found that the court found liability for DISH for those vendors. And now it's a question of looking at those violations. Uh, the trial is was started a month ago and uh, was stopped because there were some issues around uh, discovery and being able to determine that a call to a specific area code for a cell phone meant that that call happened in the state, which was important for the states being able to prove their cases. Um, but um, so, so the, the, the trial stopped kind of mid-trial and uh, the discovery was open again and they'll be resuming that trial at the end of the year. But I think it likely, um, from what I know about that case and what the court has already ruled in summary judgment motions that it will probably be the largest verdict that the FTC uh, has been able to uh, win to date. So I think it likely okay. though at the end it'll be appealed and it'll be settled but probably the largest verdict ever. Right. Wow. Okay. Um, everybody please, uh, you know, if, if you have a question and you didn't get it asked on the panel, uh, my email address is right there. Send me a personal note with your question. Um, I'll try to get you an answer as soon as we possibly can. I really appreciate everybody joining.